Hey peeps, my name is Nick, this is Board Game Brawl, and we are finally getting close to the end of the 2016 edition, yes, really, of my Top 100 Games. Hey, at least I'm finishing it up before February, that's an accomplishment, right? <laughs> any event, we are looking at the Top 100 Games that I like the most right now at this period of time, and today, in particular, we have number 20 to number 11. Let's get to it. My number 20 is Zaya, Legends of a Drift System from Far Off Games and designer Cody Miller. It was my number 16 last year, which is not a big drop, four spaces, that's negligible. And there's a new expansion coming out soon, so it might even go up further next year, depending on what the expansion adds to it. But over on Board Game Geek, it has an overall ranking of 170 and an average user rating of 7.8. This is a Space 4X game. But a very light one. Now, it can go long, and there are quite a few rules to it. But I say light because I think of a, a, a 4X game as like a huge, massive thing. Civilization building, tons of rules, lots of little um, idiosyncratic things you have to worry about. I'm sure I'm not using that word right. And uh, just lots of stuff you need to keep track of in the game. And it can go on for four to six hours or longer. But in the case of Zaya, while it can go long, that's kind of the point, is that you decide how long it's going to be. You decide how many points you're going to play to, and during the course of the game, you decide how you get those points. Because you and the other players are spacefaring peoples in your own ship, but how you go about getting points to win, to get to the threshold of victory in the game, is entirely up to you. Do you want to be a pirate? Go shoot the other players and shoot trade ships and get their stuff? Sure, go for it. You want to pick up and deliver and just get points that way? Sure. You want to just explore and get points that way? Okay. You want to get the fastest, best ship and just upgrade your ship over and over? Yeah, you can do that too. Or mix and match these different things. So in that regard, there's just so much freedom in the game. Things that you can do. And at the same time, you are uh, you don't feel like you're off playing a completely separate game from the other players. You're actually interacting with the other people, uh, racing to get these different things, uh, sometimes having to uh, shoot them down or defend yourself. And um, it can be very random. There's lots of, of dice chucking in the game, and, there, and it, you could just fly into the sun and die, <laughs> which is very funny the first time it happens to a new player. And then you either wait to see if they're done with the game forever, or they're like, all right, let's go again. Um, <laughs> so all these things can happen, but I think it's fantastic. The production values are through the roof. There's a ship. There's a miniature for every ship in the game, and there's a lot of ships in the game that you can choose from, so it's fantastic. And, up, and upgrade, too. Um, and metal coins. Ah, oh, it's just a great, great, great production. But in any event, that is Zaya Legends of a Drift System, my number 20. But over on Board Game Geek, there's always a dissenting opinion from mine, which is the correct opinion. Uh, but Grusher struggles in vain against it and says, Rating based on a reading of a comment, of a post, of a video, of a rough description of the rules. That's frankly as much information as most of these people have on these games. My number 19 is... A game I don't have. It's in the same place as my copy of Abyss with someone who's borrowed them for an interminable amount of time. It is Time Stories. That's my number 19. It was my number 13 last year. I think the only reason it dipped as far as it did, and that's not a far dip, is just because I only played like one adventure in this past year. Maybe two, but it's spread out over a long period of time. We'll get to that in a second, so it's just not fresh in my mind. But over on Board Game Geek, it is number 26 overall of all the games that might be the one that's most shocking to me because it is the most, it seemed to be the most controversial. Well, aside from Pandemic Legacy, of course. Uh, but it has an average user rating of 8.1, so people really like, those who like it, really like it. Now, Time Stories is um, an interesting piece, and the reason why it was controversial still to this day, I think, is because it's a one-and-done game. Um, not in the same way as a Legacy game. In other words, um, a Legacy game, you permanently alter the game, and you can't, in most cases, depending on the game, you can't play it again afterwards because it's, it's done. You've changed it. Um, like filling in a crossword puzzle. However, in the case of Time Stories, you could play through one of the scenarios again, but you already know what's going to happen. This is essentially a very complex choose-your-own-adventure game. Well, c complex compared to ch original choose-your-own-adventures, but um, you are a team of time agents who have to go back into not only different time periods, but sometimes alternate universe time periods, and try to fix these like time distortions. It's basically Legends of Tomorrow, but predating Legends of Tomorrow, <laughs> the TV show. I'm sure I'm the only person who's, wa who's watching this who's watched that. But... <laughs> Um, you have to go to these... There's different scenario packs. There's one that comes with the game. And uh, there's a bunch of basic components. 
one adventure comes with the game, then you have to buy more adventure packs to add to use those generic components with, and it could be anything. Without spoiling too much, you uh, could be going to an asylum, you could be going to, uh, in, in like the 1920s, you could be going to an alternate universe uh, that is basically Tolkien-level fantasy, and everything in between. Um, there's one in particular, I'm not going to spoil the main theme of it, but you go to like the 1990s America somewhere. Um, and But once you play through a scenario and figure out all the clues, you kind of don't need to play that scenario again, which is why a lot of people don't like the game. Now, uh, perhaps if I was in the position where I had only a very, very, very small amount of my budget I was able to allocate for games, I'd feel the same way. So I'm in a, a bit of a privileged position, I'll admit that. But nevertheless, I do think that the innovation in this system sort of overrides the um, annoyance of having to only... Being only able to play it when an expansion pack comes out. I also feel like when enough time passes, I'll be able to play the older ones again because there's no way with my bad memory I'll remember all the little details. I'm good at remembering major things, but little tiny things like, oh, we needed the blue gem and the red gem. You know, I'm not going to remember that. So it's not totally unplayable, and you can always have let other people in the game group play it on their own. Or just sort of sit there and play with them and just sort of coach them through the rules and just sit there and be in, sort of an inactive player in the adventure, just r rolling dice when necessary. Uh, so I love it. Uh, it's very thematic and, again, innovative. That's the thing. It's, it's one of the games in the last few years that's really refreshed my idea of what board games could be because so many other games are just the same crap over and over again. I can't stress that point enough. We'll talk about that later on in the list. But that's my number 19, Time Stories, over on Board Game Geek. Of the many people who are not having this game, Krambaza says, One play is more than I ever needed of this rules air ridden travesty of a good idea. Definitely not a game. Barely an activity. I want any time I spent on this game back. Ah, you see what he did there? He did like a time thing. That's, that's cute. But number 18, I do have a copy of, and that is Roll for the Galaxy from Rio Grande Games. It is It was my number 11 last year, slipped a little bit, uh, and has an average user rating of 7.9 on Board Game Geek and is ranked number 40. Now, Roll for the Galaxy is the spiritual successor, and uh, mostly in name successor, <laughs> to Race for the Galaxy. Race for the Galaxy... I never liked it. Now, I should like it because I like those types of card games, cards, games where you're using cards for multiple things. You're just strategically using them in a very clear and defined way. But I always thought it was just a very too abstract, uh, very themeless. It looked ugly. And it, I don't know, I can go on and on. It just wasn't for me. I've, I've played it several times, even with some of the expansions, and it's like, ah. Oh. But it's a very well loved and regarded game. Roll for the Galaxy, for that reason, I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to check this one out. Is it really going to be that different? Boy, howdy, is it different, and I feel, in my opinion, much, much better. Now, in this case of uh, Roll for the Galaxy, you're using dice, of course, hence the name Roll. And you're using those dice in order to both take, uh, you start off with a planet uh, in a home world, and you're trying to get more planets developed, more planets to ship and uh, sell your goods to and so on and so forth, and you're just trying to get points. It's not a, a major uh, thematic deal going on. But in this case, you're rolling a, a basic set of dice and you're acquiring more throughout the course of the game that represent the different actions that you want to take. So the same as in Race, where you have certain actions like produce or ship, or you produce the goods, then you can ship them on a later turn or perhaps even in the same round, and then you um, can uh, develop more uh, planets and colonies for your own civilization. But the way that it works is that you only get to lock in one action each round, you can allocate other dice behind your little screen to other actions, but you have to hope that the other players lock in those actions if you want to do them. If more than one player locks in the same action, it doesn't matter. It's pointless. So there's a little bit of a guessing game there and looking at the board state and wondering, okay, like, and looking at what the other players have done and what they've accomplished and saying, he needs to ship this round. I really hope he needs to ship this round so much that he's going to lock that in so that I'll allocate a couple of dice here, but I'm going to go ahead and put 
my uh, locked in action on produce because I know I need to do that this round. Um, so just a lot of great decision making here. I love the dice and the components and grades. So just a tiny bit more thematic in my opinion because of how you manipulate things and the tiles and all that than Race for the Galaxy. And just overall much more fun for me. That is Roll for the Galaxy, my number 18 from Rio Grande. But over on Board Game Geek, uh, Brius says, can't hold a candle to race. Really? My number 17 is Comet from Madagot Games. It was actually my number 17 last year. That's like the second or third time that's happened on the list. I didn't plan it. Very bizarre. In any event, um, I'm, actually, uh, I'm actually surprised this isn't a little bit higher, although the reason it probably stayed in place and didn't backslide at all is because a new expansion just came out in this last year, which is excellent. We'll talk about that in a second. Over on Board Game Geek, this game is rated 70 overall and has an average user rating of 7.8. And as I said, it's from Madagot Games. Now, what I like about Comet is that um, it, the theme is cool. It's um, ancient Egypt, uh, fictitious ancient Egypt, at least according to those folks in the government. What do they know? Um, where there's magic and you're summoning giant scorpions and war elephants. Well, okay. War elephants probably existed, but <laughs> I know that they did. But other things that are fantastical, like mummies, and you're using them against the other players, trying to vie for different territories and get points and control temples and get more points and things like that, and you're playing to a point threshold. However, uh, there's just so many things about this game that just work well, so much better than other area control and warlike games that I've played. First is the pyramid system, where you have these giant four-sided dice, giant compared to other four-sided dice, that you are in your city and you can level them up. You start off at a certain level at the beginning of the game and you can level them up during the course of the game by using prayer points. And um, this is the most religious I ever get, actually, playing this game. <laughs> As you use those pyramids at once or two a certain level to buy tiles, uh, each one has, each pyramid is associated with a different set of tiles that give you different types of abilities. The red tiles are much uh, more combative. The blue tiles are more for, like, support and trickery and things like that. Uh, and white is for also for support. Um, yeah, I don't know. But, uh you get these different tiles, some of them summon monsters, and that means that your playstyle might be completely different from another player because there's only so many tiles. If someone's going for one type of tile, you might go for something else. But it's all in the service of getting out on the board and sending your battalions against your opponent's battalions. And then how that is handled, very interestingly, is with very simple card combat that uh, you all have the same set of cards when you start off. You play a card, you have to set it to the side, you don't get to refresh it again until later. Um, but you have to decide, depending on, you combine it with the strength of your battalion. So if you uh, have a very weak battalion, you know you're going to lose, you might just play something that either um, is just says, okay, screw it, I'll just destroy, let my entire army get destroyed, but I'm taking as many of yours with me as I possibly can. So you play a card that deals high damage. Um, or alternatively, you can say, well, I am uh, I know I've got a huge battalion, I'm going to win this, I want to defend as many of mine as possible, so I'm going to use a weaker attack card and defend as, and keep as many of my troops alive for future use. Um, and it doesn't really matter in this game if you lose a battle. I mean, it does matter because you're giving points to the opponent, but it's not a tremendous setback to you. Other games, if you lose a battle, it's devastating. You you lose valuable resources, and all of a sudden you're playing catch-up forever. In this game, you're playing catch-up, but it's like, eh, you know, you might still be doing very well in another part of the map. So, and you add that all together with great miniatures, great looking map. Uh, some people disagree, as we'll find out in a second. And uh, But I just think the whole production value as befitting of a Madagot game is fantastic together with a great theme and great gameplay. Love it. And the expansion is really good because it adds a whole other type of pyramid with a whole other set of tiles and plus some variant ways to play the game if you're so inclined. Really, really good. Uh, it's called Tau Seti. Ta Seti is the uh, expansion. So that is Comet, my number 17, this year and last year from Madagot Games. But over on Board Game Geek, there's always a differing opinion. Frogmine says, The production of the game was, for me, an immediate warning. This game was a little too garish than I normally like. It blinded like an airbrushed van with wizards and scabbards and scorpions in a sandstorm. Oh yeah, you're talking about that love mobile, right? That good shit. My number 16 is Mansions of Madness, specifically the second edition of the game, which just came out this past year. And uh, last year, the first edition of Mansions of Madness was my number 75. So this jumped up almost 60 spaces. And you're like, well, could this possibly, could the second edition possibly be that good? Yes. 
Yes, it is. Over on Board Game Geek, they seem to agree with me because it is ranked number 32. Now, I don't remember where the original edition fell on the list, but it wasn't that high. Uh, and you, It's not that old of a game. It's like a few months at this point, so you might think it's just hype, and it's probably true. So it'll, it'll fall a bit, but it has an average user rating of 8.4, so people really, really like this edition. Now, the original Mansions of Madness was a one-versus-all game. It was very long, quite a bit complex. There's a really interesting system where the... Um, the person who was the uh, overlord, um, it was the keeper, that's the name of the title, um, had to set up what the story was going to be with like different plot points and it was variable each time from like three different options for like three different things or something like that. And then the players had to, and he had to set up all the little cards. It was just a very complicated game to set up and very long to play. And yet, I felt, a lot of people disagree, that it was worth it because it was such a rich thematic experience. Well, sir, what if I told you, I sound like my salesman voice, I could give you that same experience in a fraction of the time in letting an app do all of the work. Well, some of you are going to say, that's amazing. Some of you are going to say, an app? Fuck you. And to those people, I say, well, listen, Grandpa. No, no listen. Um, it's a fair point to say that an app does not belong in every game. Um, an app is best when it's just helping a tabletop game go along um, Normally, it's doing the onerous tasks you really don't want to do, but you still get the tabletop game experience. Some people disagree with me. I think that is what is happening with Mansions of Madness Second Edition. You still have all of the fun of the original, where you are a bunch of investigators from the Arkhamverse of um, it's got another name, but the Arkhamverse of Fantasy Flight Games with all the different same characters who are going through this creepy mansion trying to find a plot. But instead of the, uh, and now it's fully cooperative, and the the keeper in this place is taken control of by the app who sets up a story for you, sets up random elements. There's different scenarios to choose from. There's more you can purchase uh, and, and packs that you can unlock. And all the really annoying stuff is handled by the app, whereas you still get to look at cool stuff out on the board um, and uh, tiles and the, the miniatures. There, You can actually uh, use all of your old stuff from the original Mansions of Madness in this one as sort of expansion bits, or they sold big expansion packs for this new edition for people who had never purchased them in the first place, the old stuff, while there's also new content in this box too. So... And no one had to suffer. Everyone won. Uh, everyone got what they wanted out of this. And you also got a fantastic, th rich, thematic game with a lot of the annoyances ripped away. So that is Mansions of Madness, easily my number 16, the second edition specifically from Fantasy Flight Games. Over on Board Game Geek, though, Axel Kerrigan said, <laughs> says, This game is twice as good as first edition, and it sucks terribly. <laughs> My number 15 will be a controversial pick for, like, me and two other people, and that is Legendary Encounters from Upper Deck Entertainment. Uh, it was not on my list last year because last year I roped together Legendary Encounters together with a uh, Legendary Marvel deck building game, or I just said something to the effect of Legendary Marvel deck building game is the best of this system. I think they're close enough. I'm just going to, you know, not bother with it. Given more time, given a whole other year more to think about it, um, and with more versions of the Legendary Encounter system coming out, including the Predator... Well, Predator was already out last year when I did the list, but um, now there's been a, a Firefly version, there's a Buffy the Vampire version coming out, um, and probably more on the way after that. Given more time with the system, it is distinct. And I'm not going to play this in every single instance that I would play Marvel Legendary. So they do deserve their own entries. And Legendary Encounters is fantastic. Now, I would even argue that the system here is better. Um, well, I, I'm not going to say whether or not Marvel Legendary is going to be further along on my list. But, you know, Bob's your uncle. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, this is fully cooperative, whereas the original Marvel Legendary was semi-cooperative to a point, and um, this one, you're going through different scenarios of popular movies. Now, the box here is for Predator, but the original was Alien, and that just got an expansion as well. There's also Firefly um, uh, Encounters, which is very controversial because the artwork is so horrendously bad, but it actually introduced some new... Even though I don't even like Firefly at all, um, yeah, get your... I'll give you my geek card later to burn uh 
but it introduced some really interesting concepts to the system that I really liked. And it's fully cooperative. You're going through these different scenarios. It's brutally difficult. In the case of Aliens and um, Predator, you're going through the different movies of the franchise. Yes, even the shitty ones. Uh, but it's fine in game form. Trust me. <laughs> and they even made up new ones for the Alien expansion. But it uses the same core Marvel Legendary system where it's deck building Ascension style, but you're also you're playing as all these uh, famous infamous characters from these uh, movies, and then you're trying to go through these um, in uh, Alien. There's like parts of the ship that get flooded with the aliens, and it's very interesting because in the original Marvel, villains came out face up into the villain row. In these games, and both Predator and Alien cards come out face down and you have to scan them first but they inexorably keep moving down into potentially the strike zone where they start hitting you and the other characters the best thing about these encounters games is that every person has a different character that they play as with different special abilities their own unique card that's something i've always wanted to see get retroactively put back into marvel legendary as well and the, the way the strikes work it's just very very cool and predator even adds a competitive mode that works very well i was surprised i thought it would be tacked on but it's fully fleshed out out. So I really appreciate the differences that these games bring to the legendary system and to deck building in general because as even as just deck builders on their own they're fantastic. That is legendary encounters of any flavor that you want from Upper Deck. Over on Board Game Geek, Sam and Max, remember them, says, remember in the original Alien movie where hordes of aliens were overrunning the ship? Yeah, me neither. All right, before we move along, I just remembered I didn't mention the uh, user rating and uh, ranking of Legendary Encounters on Board Game Geek. It is ranked seven, 71 overall, which is really good for one of these games, and beats Marvel Legendary, by the way, on their ranking. And it has an average user rating of 7.9. Now, moving on. <laughs> My number 14 is Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island from uh, Portal Games and Ignacy Trebechek. It is. It was my... <laughs> this can't be right. Uh, I guess it's right. Again, it was my number 14 last year. Same spot. I, But to be honest, I thought that that would happen. Because I already... Back... I, I mentioned this at the beginning of the list. Um, everything from like 30 on was like the Wild West. Anything could happen. New stuff coming in. Things getting moved around. Things dropping off. But my, I figured my top 20 would be pretty stable. Um, or even my top 30. Over on Board Game Geek, this is ranked number 22 with an average user rating of 8.0. This is the, the old foey version of the game. A newer, slicker version is out that I can't really bring myself to buy because there's nothing significantly different with the gameplay or anything. It's just a cosmetic and rules upgrade, although it did need a rules upgrade. But Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Curse Island is a wonderfully thematic and rich and brutally hair ripping out of your head difficult <laughs> cooperative game you and the other players are the titular characters well it's well not really you're you're not you're just generic people who are maybe associated with robinson crusoe and maybe if you play with him you could play with friday and a dog but <laughs> regardless of that it's still very thematic regardless of its size of the story because you are stranded on an island and you need to survive now there's different scenarios of what you need actually need to accomplish everything from just basic live and signal for help or there's weird variant scenarios with like Cannibal Island and Kong Island and things like that but however you do it it's it's got Euro game elements you're exploring flipping over tiles you are building tech with worker placement type things where every player has two tokens they put out to say what I'm working on today and some of those things are the basic necessities like you have to build a fire pit you have to um, help put up the roof um, you know uh, you have to go foraging for food and you have to whenever you do any of these tasks you have to potentially draw a card from one of these like mystery or adventure decks which could be really bad a tiger attacks you a snake bites you so on and so forth but when one of those things happens um there's an effect you might have to do right away and then it might tell you to put the card back into the deck. And later on, you might have to deal with the other side of the card. Like, let's say you get bit by a snake, but you still find some food. Well, later on, you might get poisoned because the poison finally kicks in in your veins or something to that effect. So, and there's also like food might wash up on shore, but you have to get it within a certain amount of time. There's so many cool thematic bits in it. It's very, very difficult. You're probably going to starve on the very first day, but you'll get incrementally better as you go along. And I love that progression. I love the feeling of like, we are at death's door at every turn, but we're getting better and we're winning. And but most of the time you die. <laughs> but the journey is what it's all about. 
That is Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island, my number 14 this year and last year. Over on Board Game Geek, John K. Friday says, has a 40-page FAQ, which is more than specialized brain-scanning medical equipment. I'm going to say, he missed out on a golden opportunity there to say something about the fine stuff. And uh, you uh, you need brain-scanning medical equipment if you're going to play this game. Ho, ho, ho. My number 13, mercifully, was not my number 13 last year. I would have looked like a complete idiot uh, instead of just somewhat of one. Uh, it's Sentinels of the Multiverse, which was my number 20 last year. So it actually moved up. And that's because I did play it quite a few times in the last year. And also, perhaps I'm subconsciously very excited for the supposedly... Uh, that's probably not what should have been air-quoted. But <laughs> supposedly final expansion for the game, uh, which I kickstarted and which should be coming with a bunch of other stuff too. And I hope so, because it's it's time. Let's just move on to other things. But I still love this game. Uh, it is ranked number 205 on Board Game Geek, which is about right. Most people don't like it over there. And has an average user rating of 7.4. It's from Greater Than Games, which is now part of Dice Hate Me Games, or the other way around. Sentinels of the Multiverse is a superhero game that is not a deck builder. Uh, up to this point, it seems like the only successful superhero games in the board gaming realm have been deck building games. But while it is a card game, though, you and each player uh, take control of superheroes, working fully cooperatively against the game represented by a supervillain, and you each have your own deck of cards representing your hero. Uh, Many of them are archetypes of Marvel and DC, but they couldn't use those licenses, so they made their own things, like Legacy is just Superman, um, Haka is... Uh, gross Native American stereotype, um, and so on and so forth. <laughs> What's the guy from the Super Friends? You know, Chuck, and so on and so forth. But you each have your own different deck and your own special powers and your own feel. So, for instance, there's another character I really like that everyone likes um, called uh, Velocity. I forget her name, but she's the speedster of the game. When her deck is all about cycling through your cards really, really quickly, discarding cards when you don't need them anymore, it's going fast, 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 discarding cards, getting bonuses for all the cards you've discarded, and so on. It's just very thematic to the character. Whereas Legacy is just about protection, um, and other characters are just deal as much damage as humanly possible. Some characters are like fortune tellers, where they can, depending on the cards that come off the top of their deck, that gives them special effects because they're doing like random magic and things like that. So I love the theme of the game, and it's, uh, it's very done very very well in the game. The huge variety of characters from the expansions they put out at this point. Um, even just the base game, though, has a lot of characters for you to choose from. The villains are all dramatically different in how they have to do their stuff and fight back against you. People have said it's a bookkeeping game. I can see that. And this is another instance of a case where the app for the game, there's there's actually a full app version of the game, but there's also just a helper app that's really helpful for it, too. Um, but in any event, no matter how you choose to play it, I still think, still think it's a fantastic game. Um, artwork aside... I think this is one of the best superhero games out there. That is Sentinels of the Multiverse, my number 13. On Board Game Geek, though, uh, Perfect Square, spelled Piffic Square, says, Brutally boring game that would not end fast enough. If you are going to stuff a game with reams and reams of text, at least make it interesting. Recipes have more interesting text than the cards in this game. Those are air quotes. The game feels like you never stop reading the rules. My number 12 is in a large collector's box that, by turning it upwards like this, I probably ruined everything inside. That is Tonto Kore, um, originally from Arclight in Japan, now from Japan Made Games in the U.S. Um, the original boxes for these are like little small almost tuck box, card box type things uh, for each of the different sets. I have them all in here. Um, I don't recommend getting this though because you're literally just buying a box. But <laughs> it, it was my number 15 last year, so it actually moved forward a few spaces, but I think it was previously the first year of my list in my top 10. Um, it is uh, ranked 1203, that's 1,203rd on Board Game Geek with an average user rating of 6.9. No surprise there. Now, I right up front, it, I will easily confess that this is just Dominion. This is a fancier, in my opinion, version of Dominion with a theme that I like better of you employing maids and using them uh, to uh, get other maids, <laughs> which doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but it makes total sense in um, satiric anime uh, terms. Um, but what I like about this game and what I think sets it apart from the original Dominion is all the extra little systems that they put in each version of the game, especially the romantic vacation version of the game, where you have to have, like, there's, like, these little achievement cards you can go for by discarding certain types of cards and 
There's the idea that you can sack away your cards for points later. Little things like that. And in that regard, this is my favorite of the just static, non-changing deck building games like Dominion, where you have a certain amount of cards or certain sets of cards you play with from the beginning, and that's it. Much more strategic than other randomized or much more random deck builders like Ascension style games and Legendary and things like that. And yeah, I like the theme. I mean, I'm, I'm into anime and I, it just appeals to me much more than very, very, very boring and terrible artwork in games like Dominion. While I recognize that Dominion's a fine game, um, it just never worked for me because of just how boring it was. And I think the systems in this that are added on to the existing framework of Dominion are much more interesting, at least in my opinion. If I got to choose one, this is the one that I'm going to go for to each their own. Uh, tons of people hate this game and criticize it just because of the anime-made theme. There's really nothing that objectionable in it. People just extrapolate more than what's actually there. So really, it says more about them and their perversions. Think about that. In any event, my number 12 is Tonto Kore from Japan Anime Games on Board Game Geek of the many people that were there criticizing the game. Uh, most of them said some variation of, you're a stupid, filthy pervert if you like this game, which is fine. That's just boring. So I went with someone who went in a different direction. Uh, Jig Malingapa says, nothing too bad about the game, although the theme is definitely not my cup of tea, which kind of killed the fun for me. Would much rather play the Barbarossa series. Really? And lastly, for this segment of the list, the penultimate segment of the list, is Orleans, my number 11, from Tasty Minstrel Games in the U.S. and originally from DLP Games, DLP Games. Uh, it was new, brand new to the list this year, and um, has an average user rating of 8.1 on Board Game Geek, and is ranked number 28 overall. This game did really, really well in the past year and a half or so that it's been out. Actually, I grabbed the Invasion box. I didn't even mean to because um, I haven't actually uh, delved too much into this. We started playing with it a little bit and had to quit our game, so it's been a while. Uh, but I've heard very good things about this, and regardless of that, the core game is phenomenal. Hence the reason this went all the way up to number 11. Actually, it probably should have been on my list last year. I think it just missed it. Um, Orleans, now you, know, you know I love deck building games if you've been following my channel or this list at all. And Orleans is sort of deck building, but it's actually bag building. There's been a few games like this. One of them was terrible, Hyperborea. It's just awful. Let's never speak of it again. Orleans is fantastic. Um, you're doing sort of the generic Euro game things that a lot of Euro games do, which is that you have to uh, get different little workers and then use them to get more workers. And then you take those workers and you go and maybe you get some goods or you just get some points and you move up on these tracks and so on and so forth. But the fun part comes in that the or the where the bag building part comes in is that those workers are tokens you throw into a bag, and then you draw out a certain amount of them each round, and then you put them on your little board and allocate them to different areas in worker placement style, and then you'll get more workers, put them in the bag, and then you can sift out other ones. You can send them on pilgrimages to say, okay, uh, so long, go do the Lord's work. You're good, thanks, and <laughs> therefore. Uh, make your deck, your bag, what you want it to be in order to be more efficient and get more points. You can buy little tiles and improvements um, to get more spaces that only you can use. Uh, it's just, oh, it's so fun. Like, it's it's pretty themeless, I guess, and it does have some of the elements I hate in Euro games, but that bag building worker element is so much fun. And it's just a very, it's a very quick game. Like, you look at it all, and it's kind of a bitch to explain it to people. And you're like, yeah, okay. But then when you actually get into the turn to turn gameplay, oh, it flies, man. Because you're all, this is what I'm talking about when I say, you know, one of the things that makes a good game. You are constantly engaged in this game. You have to be thinking all the time. You're all, there's, you know, turns are mostly at the same time in some instances when you're placing things out. So you're never like waiting for someone to do their entire turn. Uh, just, you might have to wait for them to do their actions because it goes like round robin style, like I'm doing this, blah, blah, blah. But uh, you're still always engaged, always thinking about what you need to do, always thinking about what you need to focus on, and it makes the time fly. And it means your investment of time is more worthwhile. I just love this game. And once I get, get a chance to really delve into this expansion here, it might even move further on my list. I don't know. And there's another expansion plan, too. Uh, I can't wait. That is Orleans, my number 11 from Tasty Minstrel Games. But over on Board Game Geek, Peter Loftus says... 
In my English language version, some of the tiles were in German. This annoyed me so much, I sold the game. At least he's honest. All right, folks, that is it for uh, number 22, number 11. One more segment left, and then my closing thoughts. We're almost there. Thank you so much for your patience. Thanks for hanging out with me. been having a great time doing this. Take care.